Well, hey, welcome everybody and uh, really appreciate everyone who's tuning in to this recording. Uh, we uh, hopefully gave everybody fair warning that the uh, webinar last night on Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar was uh, not going to be recorded. And, and that was at the request of uh, uh, Professor Don. And so we uh, thought instead of uh, leaving the spot blank on our YouTube playlist that we would do a recording and a conversation, really casual and hopefully uh, some fun, with a group of uh, pretty well-informed individuals about what uh, the professor talked about the other evening. So here we go. We'll take a shot at it. And um, uh, as I begin, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Don for, for coming on and, and doing what I think was a fantastic presentation, really enlightening. Certainly for me, I learned a great deal. And I think from uh, feedback I've had since, a lot of people uh, uh, took a lot of valuable information away from that presentation. So before we get into that part of it, I want to introduce uh, this group of, uh, I think, not only well-informed, but pretty darn good-looking uh, folks who uh, I'm, I'm going to let them all uh, introduce themselves, and I'm going to do it, I guess, in alphabetical order. It works. So, Kara, you, you're going to be first. Would you mind just... Okay. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Tim. And, uh, so, it's Kara Claremont. I'm the president and CEO of Plug and Drive, and Plug and Drive is a nonprofit uh out there trying to accelerate EV adoption, mostly through uh, education and awareness raising. And so I'll leave it at that. I look forward to discussing Professor Don's presentation. Thanks, Kara. You, uh, Kara's a, a regular, so our, our regular viewers will know that uh, who she is, of course. And um, we, we've seen you a few times. You've been really a, a great supporter of, of our, uh, our uh, webinar series. So uh, thanks, Kara, and welcome. Uh, uh, alphabetical, so... Uh, I guess that's, um, gosh, uh, I guess that's you, Mo. That's it. That's great. Uh, Is that, the alphabet's hard, okay? <laughs> what I'm saying. Thanks. Just thanks. wait till we get to chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. My name is Mo Kabara. I'm a senior consultant at uh, Dunsky Energy and Climate. Uh, we're a clean energy consultancy. Uh, we're Canadian, uh, focused on accelerating the clean energy transition. Uh, including uh, uh, tr mobility and clean transportation. And uh, I work on that team um, focusing on electric vehicle adoption, charging infrastructure, but also battery and zero emission vehicle supply chain. So I'm the co-chair of the Canadian Battery Task Force. I'm also a strategic advisor to Accelerate, which is Canada's zero emission vehicle supply chain alliance. Uh, so uh, I've been in the battery, uh, thinking about batteries and storage for about 10 years, uh, I actually went to Dalhousie. So I, I know Jeff Don uh, personally, and he's, he's, he's been doing amazing work. Um, and happy to be here today to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the conversation yesterday and uh, to just uh, explore those topics with everyone here. Oh, great, Mo. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Mr. Stevens, Matt Stevens. Hi, everyone. Real pleasure to be here. So my name is Matt Stevens. Uh, my background is originally in battery degradation and electric vehicle design. So yesterday's talk was very interesting for me. Uh, after school, I, I co-founded a company called Fleet Karma with a friend of mine. Uh, we grew it over a number of years focused on electric vehicles, electric vehicle adoption, uh, joined Geotab through acquisition in 2018. Uh, left my operational role there about a year ago, still support, still involved uh, on the board of advisors. Um, and uh, within Geotab, you know, when uh, the team really focuses on helping fleets electrify all over the world and providing them the data that they need to electrify, which includes looking at long-term battery degradation of electric vehicles. So look forward to the discussion today. Oh, that's terrific. Thanks very much, Matt. That's well, talk, talk about an elite team where we're, uh, we're, it's the A team here. And I, I'm Tim Burroughs. It uh, doesn't matter who I am. I, uh, I end up uh, getting the great pleasure of uh, meeting a lot of really clever people and uh, talking about a subject that I happen to be a little bit passionate about, uh, which is uh, any, everything electrification. So uh, here, we, here we go. So we had a great, uh, uh, I think, episode of the webinar last night. And um, as we were talking earlier, learned a great deal uh, myself. And I, I hope uh, the audience that, that tuned in also got something out of it. For those who, who missed it, 
uh, sorry, you've missed it. <laughs> that, that was it. And so this is what you get. And I think we're going to do a, a pretty interesting, uh, I just have a really informal chat about it and, and maybe um, exchange some ideas on some of the, the uh, subjects that were discussed. Basically, uh, the professor began his talk by um, reminding us uh, of the urgent need to develop better batteries in order really to get away from, from fossil fuels and, and to uh, expand use of renewables. And he demonstrated uh, through the course of his presentation that lithium ion batteries uh, can now be uh, produced in a way that they'll last for 4 million kilometers of driving. And then he quickly posed the question like, why the heck would you want to? 4 million kilometers doesn't make sense. And so he went on to explain that um, uh, really he made a, a pretty strong case for uh, something we all refer to as V2G, which of course is a vehicle to grid uh, transfer of, of energy, basically pointing out that electric vehicles are arriving in, in such great numbers that the production uh, from all existing and planned battery gigafactories uh, is already, all that production is already spoken for uh, by the auto industry. So, uh, in order to take advantage of renewables, at least at scale, we really aren't going to have any choice but to depend on our collective EV batteries, those, the, all that storage that we all have in our, in our vehicles, which means that, um, of course, the vehicles need to be produced with bi-directional charging. That's just going to be a, a given, I think, as we go forward. And, and of course, he pointed out that before we want to share our batteries with the grid, we're going to want to have some assurance that it's not going to harm our batteries and that that constant charge and discharge isn't going to kill uh, that battery that we probably paid a bit for when we bought our cars. And so um, that's the reason why we need a 4 million or, uh, you know, kilometer battery uh, to be produced and available. It's really for that uh, exhaustive use in our cars that, that is likely to come and, and he believes needs to needs to happen. So there we go. That's I, I did I catch that right? Like I I'm I'm again I'm not the technical person in the room, but I think that's the gist of it. Am I, did I get did I get that right, Matt? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, the only extra things I'd add is I think he did a really good job explaining on um, the main mechanisms, the main ways that Lithium ion batteries degrade, specifically the main weight. <laughs> um, and then and then did a really good job sharing some of the details about um, how they've actually been able to design longer lasting batteries and 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 also how Dr. Don's lab has been able to improve the technology to measure, to to take tests that used to take years and and shrink those down to to weeks or months and, and that how that enabled them to 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 get to this finding faster. So so yeah, I think I think. Everything else, I, I agree fully with what with your synopsis. I just maybe extend on those couple points. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, uh, and I guess this is the world of research that uh, you know. Here you have a situation where the lab is working on a particular technology, but doesn't have the tools to do it, and so they make the tools. Uh, he he made a device that was so sensitive that they could measure, you know, the difference between a uh, charge and and the next in the discharge and the difference between the two. Uh, you know, that's uh, that, that's I guess the essence of of good research is that that ability. So yeah, I think so. Like it was painful. Like I like I I remember the days when I was back in the lab cycling batteries, and it would take months and months and months and months for you to get an initial result and. If something went wrong in your lab setup, like there was a power outage or, you know, your heat chamber went off for whatever reason, you just literally threw away four or five months worth of work. So to be able to run tests on the scale that he's talking about because they built the high precision coulomb uh, coulometry, like is, is really phenomenal. And really like, I, I, I think as much as the result is exciting, uh, it is a direct byproduct of, of, of the better, better sensing technology that they built in that lab. Yeah, and you think about it, it accelerates the process worldwide. It's not it's not something he kept to himself. It's 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 thrown out there, and everybody's being able to take advantage of that tech. Yeah. So, Mo, what was your uh, reaction? Uh, what were your thoughts after uh, hearing that presentation? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's great. I've uh, I've had, like I mentioned, I had um, the privilege to see the lab before and meet with uh, Dr. Don, also with Chris uh, from Novonics and seeing 
seeing the, the, the setup and the equipment that they've developed to really accelerate uh, the, uh, the chemistry development for the batteries. Um, so it's, it's great to see, you know, that continuing to move forward, especially also with Novonix uh, startup uh, here in Nova, Nova Scotia, that's kind of really grown significantly over the past few years with operations in the U.S. now as well. I think for me, the key takeaway there was really the emphasis on the V2G component, which is really trying to fill in that missing gap and miss, or the missing link uh, for, for V2G. Because when we talk about V2G and we work a lot with utilities who are exploring pilot programs for V2G and we, we've worked with fleets who are exploring those conversations as well. You know, one of the key points or pain points for really uh, scaling V2G is is the question of the degradation of the asset, which is in this case, the battery, right? And, the, and I think it's that if we can reach a, a technical solution where that's really not a problem anymore, or it's, not an, it's not an issue because we have so much buffer room uh, that we have millions of kilometers to work with in terms of, and that translate to thousands of cycles uh, that we can really um, overcome that barrier from a, from a perceptual, whether it's a perceptual barrier or whether it's an actual financial barrier uh, for the degradation of the asset. So I think it, this really opens up uh, adopt, uh, the adoption piece, both on distributed energy resources from the utility side. So having, uh, has, having distributed energy storage um, to be able to complement their, uh, their renewable or decarbonization strategy of the grid. But also it opens up, I think, um, you know, the adoption of electric vehicles, specifically in fleets that might not actually utilize their vehicles a lot. So one example I can think of is school buses. So for school buses, it's, you know, it's very, um, uh, the, 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 the use case there in terms of the how many kilometers they drive per day might not necessarily have a very strong financial uh, uh, benefit relatively to other high use applications. Uh, so if you're able to actually leverage school buses in a V2G and get uh, an additional revenue stream uh, to that fleet by, by integrating with the, with the utility and being able to sell kilowatt hours back to utility and using that asset and getting, getting that additional revenue stream, it really helps complement the business case uh, for, for those fleets and I think increase adoption of EVs overall. So I think there's really benefits for Easy EV users uh, to to even strengthen the already uh, good business case for driving an EV, uh, and also benefits for the utility to make sure that they're able to leverage existing assets that are already distributed already, all, uh, and being able to to connect them through a network uh, that can really um, in, integrate with their uh, renewable uh, generation, uh, integrate with their demand response programs, uh, and really help to like I'm like like uh, Jeff mentioned. To, to help us decarbonize our grids, de decarbonize our economy. Thanks, Mo. I, I, uh, before we go to Kara, just one, one sort of clarification for me. Uh, I had thought up until yesterday that this notion of bidirectional and, and sharing your, your, your energy with the grid was more a case of shallow charge discharge scenario. I, and yet uh, Professor uh, Don was talking about it in terms of deep discharge several times a day. Which is it, do you think? Well, I think, I think it's, it really depends on, the, on the, like the way that the vehicles are used. So if you can think of particular uh, use cases in the vehicles where the, maybe they're used once a week, for example, right? So you you have you have more windows of opportunity for engaging that battery uh, versus vehicles that might be used on a daily basis. And I think it's really going to be dependent on uh, on the particular characteristics of the use case for that for that fleet or for those vehicles. Uh, when we're talking about fleets, when we're talking about individual vehicles. I think you know there are different. Um, uh, different ways to design the program so to, so that it doesn't interfere with the the way that the vehicles are being used day to day and it does not actually uh, compromise the performance of the vehicles and compromise the way that the user wants to wants to uh, or the way they drive in, in terms of the driving habits uh, but generally I would say even with uh, you know shallow uh, charging discharging there's there's that perception that you know, uh, it, it's going to degrade the battery and there's there's also real uh, impact that is it will degrade the battery not obviously not as much as as, as a deep charge discharge but there but with that perception I think what's 
what, what, what you know if we know or if the user knows that this battery can last for millions of kilometers i think there's the appetite for uh, signing up for the, those programs will definitely increase by by a lot and i think that's really what the biggest benefits of having t such technology on on the on the road or on the market would would do yeah, great. Thanks, Kara. So uh, tell me, um, in your experience with, at, uh, with Plug and Drive and the EV Discovery Center, has V to G, vehicle to grid, uh, entered the sort of common vernacular? Like, are people, is that something yet that has um, sort of appeared in any of your discussions with consumers? Well, not really. I mean, to be honest, it's really more um, something you hear from the early adopters, from a crowd like this one, you know, we, we talk about it. And in fact, it's interesting. There were two things that really stood out for me in the talk. As someone who's not a battery expert, I didn't realize it was all about the electrolyte or all about actually more specifically the additive to the electrolytes. I, I, I didn't appreciate that. So that was actually something that I learned. But on top of that, um, I think for most EV drivers and, you know, including me, um, you think about the, the battery as this resource just, you know, for driving. And of course, some of us do think about, okay, you know, shifting load and maybe, you know, even that would help the utility if we just shift our time of use. Um, and the V to G kind of seemed like something in the future, but the thing like we did a study uh, just a year ago on you know the V to G potential in Ontario, but even then, and so I understood it. But even then, we were focused on sort of hey, you know, if you do a storage, uh, some sort of secondary storage, those are brand new batteries. Whereas if you use car batteries, someone already bought them, and so it's just you know, in, you know, intuitively, it's more affordable. And so we were more focused on the affordability of comparing sort of a storage in your car battery versus storage, um, you know, that would be new batteries. And of course it's, it's much cheaper, which is good. But what I hadn't considered was what he showed right at the beginning, which is that most of the batteries being made are car batteries, like 90% or something. And it kind of hadn't dawned on me that, oh, it's not even just that we shouldn't do those other batteries or they're more expensive. It's like, we can't get there just doing that. We have to use the car batteries if we really want to maximize storage and actually be able to take advantage of all the renewables. So that was sort of, I, I felt for me, that was a bit of an eye opener because I was already a believer, but then I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's actually critical. It's not just something that we might like to do. Yeah, I, I totally share that that revelation. I, I had never it had never occurred to me that this was um, the, the really the only apparent pathway forward, and and so um, it, it appears that if we want to clean up the grid with renewables, using car batteries in our driveway or in our our garages is is, is at the moment it seems like it's the only only pathway forward. And so, right, yeah, and it's interesting because you don't, I mean, there's some little pilots going on, but you don't see anything on a, a big scale in terms of aggregation happening, at least not that I'm aware of in Canada yet. You see, you see it elsewhere a little bit. Um, uh, I, I wonder if some of the other folks here know of, of more studies that are happening, because I'd like to see some more major aggregation, uh, you know, studies happening. Yeah, well, I, I see Matt, uh, sort of shaking his head a little bit there. He, uh, for those who haven't caught it, there's a, uh, Matt was, has also been a previous guest on uh, Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar and uh, did an episode in which he, he uh, raised what probably for some was a controversial um, uh, perspective on the potential reuse of batteries uh, in cars. And I think Matt, if I can remember correctly, the essence of what you said is that basically, you know, taking out a, a, the battery from an eight-year-old EV and trying to do something with it was going to be such a pain that uh, it combined with the fact that battery technology is evolving at such a pace that those two things meant that those batteries were ready for recycling. They're, they're, they don't, the second use idea is perhaps not as, as um, 
attractive as some of us might like to think. But but please, uh, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I think it's both sides to have a contribution view. But yeah, so so generally, as someone who has tried for many years to make the case for secondary use batteries and has never been able to, yeah, I kind of went through the the two main things that make that at least historically, and that's where yesterday's talk may you know actually I think broadly eliminates one of those two concerns, um, but the other one still remains. So. You know, we talk eight, 10 years, but the reality is the average lifetime of a vehicle is 16 years, so we're 2022. 20, so, so you would expect a vehicle to come offline, like the battery to become available if it was a 2006 right now, right? That would be the normal vehicle coming out the road. Uh, EVs weren't really in production until 2010, right? Like Kara's was one of the first Leafs and yours was a 2010, right, Kara, or 2011? Yeah, so, so let's pretend like it was 2010, right? So, so that's, that's a shorter lifespan, like you would expect to have an older battery. Yeah. When Kara bought her vehicle, the price, so there's two things. First off, you know, the battery's coming out of a 2010 Nissan Leaf right now versus a brand new battery off the line with Dr. Don's, you know, new chemistry. Those are very different batteries, right? Like the new battery is a way, way, way better battery. Let's be clear. And in much better shape because it's fresh, it's new. In addition, you know, when Kara bought her vehicle, that battery cost the OEM about a thousand bucks a kilowatt hour or more. And so the general thesis of second life batteries is, oh, well, the second life will sell it at 20% of the original cost. Okay, so 20% of the original cost of that 2010 battery is $200 a kilowatt hour. Current brand new batteries are less than $200 a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. so, so do you want this 12 year old battery that's been beaten up is degraded is probably somewhere around 70% of its original capacity, you know, might be close to actually having some failures, right? In different cells or different modules um, with a legacy thing for $200 a kilowatt hour, or do you want a brand new pack for, let's call it, well, if you're buying small volume, you're, you're gonna be about 200, but, but let's say like 180, 170, if you can get in on some of the, the more higher- So Matt, prices. you're saying I gotta donate my battery. <laughs> basically yeah yeah <laughs> so 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 it's like, well, right now right and so I, th I think there's two things that change that right and so that's where tim like i'm i'm i have not been able to make a case for those two reasons first off after 16 years the battery's pretty beaten up and the second thing is 20 percent of original it's not 20 percent of today's price of batteries like the whole business model was based on 20 percent of the original price of the battery and the downside of the phenomenal price reduction curve we've been on with batteries, which is fantastic, is that it makes secondary life really, really junky because yeah. because 20 percent of 16 years ago is more than a battery costs fresh now. Right. And so two things will change. One is that curve will flatten. I, I don't think there's an expectation it's going to follow Moore's law. So it will plateau and we're already seeing it somewhat plateau. So, you know, maybe we're in the 130, 140 now. And, you know, I, I never thought in my life there was a way to get under 100. Now I believe there is a way to get under 100. But maybe it's 90, maybe it's 80. It's not going to continue to go down for 70. So that will flatten. Mm -hmm. And now with Dr. Don's, you know, what he showed yesterday is we will have batteries that will come out of a vehicle 16 years in that have a lot of life left in them. And so, so my view around Second Life, I, I think there is a point in the future where it's very attractive. I am glad I'm not in that business today. I'm glad I'm not in that business in four, four or five years from now. I'm glad I'm not in that business 10 years from now. But, but I think it's a really good eventual business to be in. But you need the batteries that Dr. Don's talking about to now be out because now the clock starts, which means if those are some of those are getting into vehicles today, in 16 years, that, vehicle, that battery will be useful. So in 2038, it's a great business model because like the, the batteries coming off the vehicles will have a lot of life left in them. And at that point, prices will plateau. So, so, so I, it's, it's a good news story. There's, yeah. there's a great opportunity for someone who's patient and ready to wait. So for years. our kids, essentially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's great. It's meaningful. We should be in it. I just, I just, I, I wouldn't invest my dollar in that today. Well, and I, and I picked up on a point that, uh, Don said that about, um, the need to be thinking ahead in terms of our design of the actual uh, pack, right? So that we that the packs are designed in such a way that they can be 
uh, dealt with down the road more easily. I mean, that th there's some thought that can go into that that will make uh, future, whether it's reuse or disassembly and, and uh, recycling, some thought can go in now that will make you know whatever comes down the road a lot easier and, and more um, efficient and profitable. Yeah. yeah. So Mo, what what was your take on things last night? Did did you um, were there any surprises in this for you? Um, not necessarily. I've I've seen the paper uh, that, and I've seen Dr. Don uh, present before on this particular topic. I think for me it was more the emphasis, like I mentioned, on the B2G and really seeing that, seeing the the question from that lens. Um, I think also like uh, the conversations around you know, the different chemistries, like the, the iron phosphates and the, the sodium batteries, like I've, I've been keeping up with that, but like, I was surprised to hear that CATL is coming with a sodium battery in the next couple of years mm -hmm. uh, on the market. Um, and then kind of seeing the um, comparison of sodium batteries in terms of their uh, capacity to the, uh, to the iron phosphate in terms of the energy density, right? Uh, so if we're accepting iron phosphate as a lower cost, uh, solution uh, that would meet the demand for the vast majority of, of, of the public in terms of their driving uh, patterns. Like, you know, most people are not going to acquire the very, very high range that we currently have. Um, I thought it was very interesting that, uh, you know, there was, there was some conversations of those uh, other chemistries uh, that, that could still also uh, help fill in parts of that uh, puzzle uh, in terms of, you know, uh, lower cost solution. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. I was trying to understand, uh, again, I'm not a, a technical person, so I'm just a, a lay person listening to this. And um, there were a few things around the, the different chemistries that sort of prompted questions in my mind. One of them was uh, that uh, he mentioned that the, the notion that uh, the, the, the uh, sodium approach had great potential but needed a lot of work right mm -hmm. um and and i just i don't know where that stands and is that a, is that have great potential to surpass the um iron iron phosphate approach or um what what, what is it about that 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 holds such attraction it's a cheap metal an expert but i it's thought it abundant was cheap, metal. So cheap right isn't it yeah. so inexpensive yeah yeah and, and so, but it just requires a whole lot more work, right? To get it there. Is that, that's where, where we well, are. Yeah. And I think it's because of the focus, you know, if you, I, I mean, this is, this is sort of just me thinking out loud is like, if we think about what has been the driver for the development of lithium batteries, it's been uh, portable and consumer electronics that required very high density uh, of, in terms of energy storage, they had to be light, they had to be uh, energy dense. Right. And that's mm -hmm. been kind of the driver behind that technology development for the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and then, uh, whereas there hasn't been as much interest in the sodium uh, ion batteries, b b uh, you know, because of that inherent limitation on the energy density side, if you think about it, like lithium is the lightest metal. So it makes sense that it would have a higher energy density, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and lithium iron phosphate versus like lithium NMC that we're talking yeah. about, those are much more similar than going to a sodium battery. Because right? if you're the lithium iron phosphate versus lithium NMC, you still have lithium as the ion moving back and forth, and you have still have a graphite anode. You just have a slightly different cathode. They're 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 very similar cells with yeah. with similar materials, right? If you're moving to sodium, like you're still an oxide metal, you're just like one row down on the table of elements. So it 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 has similar behaviors in some ways to lithium, but but it's a lot changes, right? Like this is not a small trivial change moving yeah. from a lithium cell to a sodium cell. Yeah, is there much of the existing technology that, well, I guess he, he referred to that, the existing technology that can't really be uh, applied to sodium, right? It's, it, it needs to be a fresh a fresh approach. Is that fair? Yeah, like, like th there's things back in the day that were taken from nickel metal hydride that you could learn some concepts and, and use some of the ideas in, in lithium ion, even though they're very different chemistries. Um, Sodium cells might be a little more similar than lithium, but but so there's some concepts that translate and some learnings and and even like like Dr. Don's um, high precision coulometry, like that approach would probably be equally as good with sodium cells. Yeah. But there's a lot that changes. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's also a, can, a Canadian company 
um, salient energy that's working on a zinc ion battery, but mainly for stationary storage because of the, just the weight is going to be too much for any kind of mo mobile application. Uh, and they're, they've, they've used uh, some of the testing equipment in, the, in Halifax. That's kind of, they actually moved from Ontario to Nova Scotia to be able to uh, have easier access to the battery ecosystem in the province and the, the testing equipment uh, at Novonix and, and uh, uh, Dr. Don's lab. Uh, and he's, had a, he's been very supportive of, 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 those, of those companies uh, around the ecosystem. But as uh, Matt mentioned, you know, there's, you can leverage some of that, but then the chemistry becomes very, very different in terms of, you know, the, 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 the different uh, components that you're going to start to work with. It, it's going to, it's going to be a very different uh, equation to, to solve for. Uh, but I, but I think like, uh, it's interesting to see now that we're exploring those, those options that might, uh, might not necessarily yield the, the, the highest energy density and also by uh, by extension, might not yield the, the might not be the longest range of batteries in terms of an EV, right? And I think it's like are are we reaching a point where um, that range anxiety is is sort of um, dissipating a little bit? I don't know, I don't know, I don't think we have reached that point, but can we start to think about these technologies that knowing that in the future with the proper infrastructure and proper awareness in terms of uh, the actual Use, use usage patterns by drivers and how much they actually uh, need in terms of kilowatt hours uh, that we can actually start looking at solutions that might not give us 500, 600 kilometer range, but, but might give us more around 200, 300 kilometers of range that is would be perfectly fine for most people, most of the days. And then with the exception of, 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 of a few days a year or, or, or something like that, do we not let's not rule out those options where I think there was a big push to prove the technology or to prove EVs in the, in the uh, after you know the first iterations that we were just going for the highest range, highest energy density. And that was a big push there. And we're starting to see a divergence a bit from that on the iron phosphate and even you know with Tesla adopting iron phosphate. Um, and maybe maybe that opens up the door for uh, for for researchers and and companies to develop uh, alternative chemistries like sodium batteries. I think that's really what's opening that door. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that uh, I, I I do a lot of uh, public speaking about electric cars and uh, in an educational sense, hopefully, with, for folks who who aren't really uh, you know up to speed on on where we are and what's happening. And one of the things, of course, we always you know, hear about range anxiety, and a, a lot of it I know is, is uh, unfounded, even today. We, we have plenty of range in the cars for most use cases. But, you know, I'm starting to, things are changing, and I'm starting to get uh, more, I'm not going to say pushback, but more um, commentary about, uh, first of all, winter driving. We all know that that, that takes its toll. Apparently, it's good for the batteries to be cold, but not so good to use them in the cold. Uh, but there's another component that I'm hearing, I've heard several times recently, and that's towing. And so, well, we might say that 400 kilometers is plenty of range for 90% of EV buyers. Uh, we still need to have more than that in order to deal with real life use. Uh, if you're pulling a trailer, I had, a, I had an individual who recently reached out to me and who bought an electric car after one of my talks and said, you said I could tow a car, you could tow with this thing. And so off he went with two snowmobiles in the dead of winter uh, on an open flatbed trailer. And he couldn't get from where he wanted to go to, to the, well, he, he could get to the charger, but just barely. And he was kind of bummed out about that. You know, he said, oh man, you said I could tow, but the, the hit on range. So, I mean, if you had, if he had 800 kilometers of range to begin with, he wouldn't have that issue. So, uh, I, and even if you only do it a couple times a year, you know, a purchaser of an EV is going to want that extra, extra range. So, um, yeah, like I can speak from personal experience. So, so I, you know, I, I used my wife's Model Y to go pick up a log splitter. My wife's Model Y has a little over 500 kilometers of range. It was, you know, minus 18, minus 20. So cold, but not, not as cold as it can get. Um, I, my, my real world range was just over 200 kilometers in cold weather towing, right? So that's a, that's a pretty heavy hit. Yeah. Um, so it was fine, I was able to get there, but I had to supercharge on the way up and then supercharge on the way back. And, and, and so yeah, so I, 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 I think if you have, and, and that was fine, it was good, 
but I'm glad I didn't start with, you know, 300, 350 kilometer rate of range. And then you bring down and you're, you're just over a hundred kilometers of, of tow slash cold range. Yeah. That is the worst potential scenario. Like I'm working that vehicle hard. I do, I don't do it frequently, but I, I agree with you. And especially with all the work that we do with fleets, like it is the coldest day, the longest you drive and most fleets are, are carrying pretty heavy loads depending on the type of fleet. And so you have to factor that in. Will it do range on the coldest day with highest payload? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like uh, prepare for the worst case scenario and, and be able to to deal with it. Yeah. Oh, Kara, yeah. do, do you hear a lot about that? Uh, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, the challenge is, um, you know, sort of the average driver versus sort of these one-off scenarios. And, um, and of course they are real things that people are concerned about. So I don't mean to say they don't matter, but what we try to focus on for a lot of folks is to think about the, I think Mo mentioned it already, think about the 99%, not the 1% and to like get a vehicle that makes sense for you. Like, you know, most of the days of the year now, okay, what would you do in that one-off scenario? Maybe you rent a car, maybe you do something else. And, uh, you know, some folks are going to be on board with that and some won't. I think uh, with sort of today's adopters, uh, Canadian, average Canadians, you know, most of the Canadian families that we talk to, they have two cars in the family and the electric is the second car. I mean, it's not always... You know, it's not in my case, but you know, like most families. And so they're still using that gas car for these kind of one-off scenarios, like the trip to Algonquin or the, you know, the trip out West or whatever the thing, the one thing. And that helps them, you know, to be able to adopt the electric in the other car. I think these sometimes, you know, I do hear a lot of people say, you know, well, what about, you know, when I want to do X, whatever it is, and it's a one time a year thing. And mm -hmm. um, you hate for people not to choose an electric car because once a year they tow a boat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what, it, it, I'm, I'm uh, what seven winters in with electric vehicles. I've never had that problem. And I drive a oh, lot. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I drive a lot, but what I, my learning was that with, you just have to uh, plan differently and me, I don't see once a year being impossible. I see once a year being less convenient. Mm. Like I, I can still do what I want to do, but I need to plan more carefully. And uh, it might not happen as easily or quickly as it would have been previously. But, but you saved a, a bucket of money. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, old, the old comeback is go for that once a year, go rent a car. But uh, yeah, and, and I had no issue having to do it. I'm more just saying like if the idea is, hey, people only use 200, 300 kilometers. And so right. that 500 right. kilometer, yeah, exactly. Well, certainly was an issue for us. I, I, I try to actually use a lot of Matt, Matt's, got, Matt's uh, old company from Fleet Karma now, Geotab. They have a lot of great data on like cold weather driving and on, um, even on actually, I already knew that the batteries had a lot of extra cycles in them because, you know, Fleet Karma had done a study on, on that as well. But, um, but you want to be upfront with people. That's the one thing. Like we are always doing the EV education, and I never try to put like a smiley face on something that is not too smiley because you don't want people to then be pissed off. You know, have, yeah. have done something and it's actually not working for them. So you do want to make sure that if, let's say, they do a lot of road trips or a lot of towing, like you know, then maybe it's not going to be the greatest thing for them it's got, it's got to fit their life yeah or upsize the battery right like if you yeah. have battery options just go to the one line a little higher that's exactly. all yeah and, and that's the thing that i think that's kind of the hopefully the future is that instead of your second car being electric and your main car being uh, gas is that your main car is a high range uh an MC battery that is, right. that is that is super good and then your second car is an iron phosphate or a battery right. uh, battery car yeah. that's like you use or maybe it'll uh, be yeah. an autonomous one that just you don't own that's going to come and pick you up yeah 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 i know that uh, there's there's for example like the electromechanica in bc their company working on the solo which is like a they call it a, a mission vehicle <laughs> where it's just yeah. like a three-wheeler and so definitely that's not going to be your only car for the. 
Yeah. 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 But I would be really interested, Tim. I hope you don't mind. And to, uh, Mo may know more about this and maybe Matt too than I do. He didn't talk a lot about the supply chain. It did come up a little bit at the end in the questions. But, um, and you know, you hear the government constantly talking about this great opportunity. And we have lithium in Canada, we have cobalt in Canada, we have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, but it seems like we're doing a lot of talking and not a lot of mining. And um, I'm just wondering, like, is that a re like, is it realistic that we are gonna, Canada is, cause we're kind of behind now, like others are doing it now and we seem to just be talking about doing it. I'd be really curious to hear what others had to say about that. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to chime in. I'm, as I mentioned, so I'm the, I'm the co-chair of the Canadian Battery Task Force, which is do, solely fact, uh, focused on the battery supply chain conversation. So we have mining companies, we have, uh, uh, cell, potential cell manufacturers, uh, active materials manufacturers, uh, and OEMs. Um, and also previously I used to work for Industry Canada as the investment traction officer, uh, focusing on the zero emission vehicle supply chain, battery supply chain. Uh, so I've been, I've been, um, I was involved since the start of the conversation around three years ago regarding the battery opportunity for, for Canada. And I would say that, you know, your, your, your intuition, or I guess what you what you observe regarding the lot of talk and no action, is very uh, is, is very astute because we actually published a report called "Turning Talk into Action" uh, <laughs> uh, last spring uh, through the Canadian Battery Task Force, uh, right before it became an officially the Canadian Battery Task Force, and I think it's clear that the window of opportunity is is closing. Uh, Canada does have an, a real opportunity. We have, we, but like the window is closing, and there's a need for a comprehensive, a national EV, EV, uh, EV and battery strategy in terms of on the on the industrial side, to really capitalize on this uh, advan on these uh, advantages that we have. So we have advantages when it comes to the availability of critical minerals and metals in Canada. Uh, but as you mentioned, like we're not really mining any lithium right now. The nickel that we do mine, it's all um, captive, to other, captive to other industries. Uh, the, 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 the graphite, uh, there's, there's, there's some mining that's happening, but none of that is really feeding into uh, a zero emission vehicle supply chain or battery supply chain. But I think the opportunity is starting to materialize a bit more. Uh, we're seeing uh, some a battery cell announcements happening. So there were two how that happened earlier, uh, or I guess late late in the fall, uh, from Stromvolt and British Volt in Quebec. Uh, in Quebec, uh, some announcements that have been sort of uh, I would say maybe you know uh, uh, orchestrated leak uh, that happened uh, with LG Chem potentially having a facility in Windsor. Uh, there hasn't been confirmed, but there's been conversations around that. There's also conversations about other uh, major battery cell manufacturers. Uh, so th there seems to be something in the works that could materialize in the, in, the, in, in Q1 or early Q2 of 2022 uh, on, the cells, on the cell manufacturing side. But I think it's that the focus on only cell manufacturing misses the opportunity uh, of all the value added activities that are along the supply chain. So if we think about the, what the battery supply chain is, you know, from the mining side to the uh, processing of the, of, the chemi of the minerals and metals into um, chemical precursors, and then moving that into active materials like uh, cathode and anodes, you know, well, there's a lot of value added uh, economic activity uh, in those processes. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's also a big incentive to have that part of an integrated supply chain that is localized. So as Matt mentioned, you know, we're reaching sort of a plateau in terms of how much technology can bring the cost down for batteries, right? We're, we're approaching that, um, you know, that, that point where we can't really bring the cost down much more by optimizing the technology itself or optimizing the manufacturing processes. And we're gonna have to find other ways to, uh, for cost reduction. And one of the ways that, you know, if we look at the Tesla battery day last year that, really is, was, the, was the biggest highlight from that whole conversation in terms of how they make a $25,000 vehicle. It's basically vertical integration along the supply chain and specifically along the battery supply chain. So I think um, you know, with the emerging opportunity for having a North American battery supply chain to support the emerging EV industry in North America, 
Um, Canada does have a real opportunity, but we are, you know, like uh, last week, uh, you know, there's an announcement of a 50 gigawatt hour facility in the U.S., right, in Michigan. Um, we, so we 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 don't have we haven't been able to capture that opportunity, but the cathode materials that need to feed that plant, uh, the the anode material that needs to feed that plant, the active material, the the chemical precursors that need to feed the cathode materials. How do we make sure that we're seeing this as a part of an integrated North American market, similarly to how we operate the current automotive sector? And uh, how do we turn that into a real uh, incremental gain for the economic, uh, the economic landscape in Canada, uh, especially that we've, we, we, we have been on the decline in terms of losing a lot of automotive jobs over the years. You know, we were used to be in the top five globally, and now we're uh, 14, 15, right? So... Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a long-winded answer to your question, but uh, it's kind of some some of my thoughts. Thanks, thanks, Mo. So, so I can't add anything useful to to what most like Mo understands that world much better than I do on on, on battery manufacturing and the opportunity. I I, I will add something though, because in a I think I can say this now because it won't sound self-serving because I don't have an operational role at Geotab as much as I still support the team. I, I really do think Canada has an opportunity to just. We should do all the work that, that Mo's saying on batteries, but let's take a more inclusive view of, of the opportunity for mobility and automotive supply chain. Like within Geotab, you have the largest fleet management company in the world, headquartered in Oakville, with big offices in Oakville, Waterloo, Burnaby, Laval, and the list goes on. Um, and, and, you know, when we got acquired by Geotab, there were 300 people. Geotab is now 2,100 people. That's 1,800 jobs added over a three-year window. Um, and, and the largest fleets all around the world, all, almost all the fleets that are going electric as uh, on the front end are using Geotab and Canadian built technology to help decide where they put EVs in their fleet and how to run them successfully. And so, so I, 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 I just think there's some new opportunities with electrification, um, for phenomenal job growth and, and economic or even all the charging companies that have sprung up in Canada. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah. No, exactly. I hear you. That's, that's and, a better way of looking at it. And, and actually yeah, that's a great point. So one of the things that I, what we've been trying to do is make, make the conversation more about the emerging zero emission vehicle supply chain, uh, more widely. That's why we founded accelerate. It's uh, right there, uh, which is the, which is not just about batteries. So there's a lot of, there's powertrain components, there's charging infrastructure, uh, there's uh, software solutions that are coming up that are going into the cars going and supporting the whole ecosystem around it. And I think, uh, you know, there's been a whole, uh, there's, there's been a focus about batteries because it's, it's a hot topic, but I think mm -hmm. it's like we're, we're losing, sen we're, we're losing um, a lot if we don't think about all the other opportunities, you know, like for example, uh, in December, there was an announcement for, uh, you know, me, uh, rare earth metals. Uh, so it was a uh, GM, two, two different announcements with GM and two different companies uh, to supply rare earth metals for the powertrain components and the, and the motors. Uh, you know, th that part of the conversation is currently not really looked at because we're thinking about the lithium and nickel and cobalt, but there's also other, other metals. So that's one part. And on the other side, you know, we have, we have manufacturers of, of charging infrastructure um, in, in, in Quebec and, and solution providers. And I think that, uh, you know, also like the medium and heavy duty vehicle industry in Canada with, uh, with Lion, with Nova Bus, uh, with, uh, with New Flyer. Sure. So the opportunity is a lot more comprehensive than just batteries. And I think also, uh, as you mentioned, Kara, like the, all the install, installations of charging infrastructure as well. So not just the actual manufacturing, but yeah. all the jobs. And we're currently going to be doing a, sure. high, a high level analysis that looks at you know, what is, what is the, what is the economic opportunity for the uh, ele electricians and installers and, and the different uh, construction jobs associated with the charging infrastructure that will be going, going uh, online to support uh, the growing EV population uh, up until 2050. Uh, if I could, I, I'm going to sort of do a little bit of a segue uh, from charging infrastructure to talk about something that maybe Kara, you, you, you have some more, uh, familiarity with and that is and this is something that comes up all the time and, and uh, professor talked about uh, v to g so much the other night what about the grid uh, i mean i mean we are, I, I don't what i've been hearing and i i'm hear lots of different thoughts on it the amount of energy that that we need to uh convert everybody to to electrification 
uh, isn't is seems to be less of a concern than the infrastructure uh, to support that. Uh, and all our, and I think that you know and uh, Dr. Don said that in Nova Scotia, the government's been you know or the utility's been proactive and thinking about this and and taking action to prepare for v to G bidirectional and and uh, but he didn't know really about the rest of the country. Um, you, you have a connection in Ontario with that, yeah. that uh, area. What do you think there? Are we in trouble or are we going to be able to, uh, to, to keep up? Well, I would say in this sort of first 10 years of, of EVs, you know, if you think of, you know, EVs really only been around 10 or 12 years, you know, the answer has been, we got lots of generation. That's not the problem. Um, because in particular in Ontario, but in other provinces too, because we have the surplus at night, you know, because we have, you know, nuclear and hydro that run 24 seven. So at night we tend to have a big surplus, which we dump. And still to a pretty large extent, we still operate that way. And so we're dumping it in New York state, we're dumping it into Quebec at a loss pretty much every night. And so EVs actually are a great economic opportunity because you know, we get people to suck up that surplus, which we lose money on. Um, it's, it's a good news story for the grid and it's a good news story, um, you know, for, for the province because the province owns most of the assets, the electricity assets. Now, um, we won't always have that big surplus at night because uh, Ontario's Pickering's gonna come out in a couple of years and all of a sudden the story changes a bit. And I think, you know, so, so we will need more generation for sure, but I still think, you know, that's not necessarily a problem if it's planned out. It's just, you know, it's like you build more oil and gas, you build more electricity. I mean, I vote build more electricity, it's okay. Um, where there has been some, you know, even now with, you know, with the surplus we have, you know, you gotta get people to charge at the right time. And Matt, you know, was involved in a study where we said, hey, like Toronto Hydro customers, will you shift to the nighttime? And people will, if the sig the price signal is there, uh, Electra's just done a study that showed people will shift if the price is right. And so it's easy to get, to get that going. I think we can figure that out. There are just pockets in Ontario where the infrastructure is old and they do have to, you know, they're a bit constrained here and there where you need a new transformer or something. But for the most part, like probably even for the next 10 years, we're, we're, you know, we're not in like a crunch, but if like everybody went to EVs, you know, all at once, yes. I mean, it's not probably gonna happen quite like that, but then I would say, yes, you know, we need a lot more generation than we currently have, unless Dr. Dom is right, and we're going to all do V to G and we're going to, you know, help solve the generation crisis with our, with the power that's sitting in our driveways, which maybe partially we will. Yeah, does that mean then that uh, all of the gas peaker plants that we have are stranded assets? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I hope so. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I think for now we're, go we're gonna need them, but they're gonna be needed very infrequently in my opinion, unless Pickering comes out and we are not ready, you know, and then we're gonna be relying on natural gas uh, for more than just peak. We're gonna mm. be relying on natural gas for, for big parts of the day, which, uh, which is, you know, not good when you think about the fact that we've basically spent the last 10 years bragging about how, you know, getting off coal was like the biggest carbon reduction in North America and our grid is so low emitting and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we got, we, we can't let that happen, right? That we're gonna do that. So I hope as we come out of off Pickering that we're gonna be doing a combination of more storage, whether that's V2G and other things and also more renewables and also uh, maybe those uh, SMRs, but I don't think those will be ready quite yet. But those small nuclear reactors is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, interesting, very interesting. Well, we we've been going at it here a little while, uh, and uh, probably a good time to to wrap up. Really appreciate the conversation, the the input, the ideas, the thoughts. Uh, maybe we'll just do a, a once around um, final words, final thoughts about uh, last night or uh, going forward. Matt, you want to kick it off? 
I gotcha. So I, 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 so extremely exciting. You know, I think it's really phenomenal what, what Dr. Don and, and his lab has been able to help and move the entire industry. And the fact that we, you know, now have technology that we can deploy that has 10,000 cycles in it is fantastic. I hope people don't wait to try and adopt the 10,000 cycles. We have the, the batteries we have now easily run 1,000 to 2,000 cycles without an issue, which is the life cycle of how most people use their vehicles right now. And so um, it's a good news story. It's only going to get better. It does open up new opportunities. I'm maybe not quite as bullish on V2G as everyone else. I think there are good use cases, but not as many as there's. I think there's more elegant options, but still it doesn't matter you know, having batteries that can last 40 years or a million miles or, or 4 million, sorry, a million kilometers, 4 million kilometers, that opens up new opportunities. And that's fantastic. We have great EVs now. People could and should use them now. The battery will outlast most of the vehicles already. So, so this just opens up new goodness. That would be my takeaway. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, Mo, what do you think? Last uh, fi final thoughts? Yeah, I, thought, I think the, the talk yesterday was great. Um, you know, it's very encouraging to see, as, as Matt mentioned, uh, the technology uh, that's there. I hope it comes uh, to the market in vehicles uh, as soon as possible, uh, especially as, as kind of we're, we're talking about exploring that V2G opportunity. I do think that, you know, it's, you know we, we have to also be careful you know, when we talk about V2G and make sure that we're really uh, understanding to what extent it can support, um, you know, actual decarbonization of the grid and to what extent do we actually need stationary storage that's dedicated. And hopefully we can start using some second life batteries that actually can last a lot for a long time uh, that can actually uh, make it to a second life. Uh, but I think also one thing that uh, the long life cycle um, uh, and it uh, helps with is uh, those who are going to be dependent on fast charging uh, for the vast majority of the time. So we're talking about, we, we call them garage orphans. Uh, so people who don't have access to charging at home because uh, they live like me in Montreal, I live like on a street where there's, I don't have a driveway or, or a garage. And in that situation, if you can imagine, well, yeah, you go to Costco or you go to the grocery store and you can charge there for 20, 20 to 40 minutes, 350 kilowatts. That's you know the future, uh, but what 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 is that going to do to the actual battery relatively to um, the peer that charges level two all the time, uh, 90, 90 to 95 percent of the time? So if if that also can help, um, you know, though in that situation, I think that's also going to help unlock a, a unlock part of the market uh, and help ease that anxiety re related to ba battery degradation from depending on um, on fast charging all of the time for, for uh, because they don't have access to home charging. Yeah. So I think I think good news on the V2G side, good news on uh, the second second life, a better second life, and then also good news for fast charging, uh, especially for those who are going to be dependent on it a lot more than what's going to be the average case. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Mo. Hey, Kara, your turn. Okay. Well, the, the, you know I agree with Matt that uh, it shouldn't stop people. Uh, we've got good batteries now; they'll be great later. Uh, but but good now. So let's so let's do it now. And I think probably the folks watching this uh, webinar for the most part are probably the converted for the most part. It's going to be. But so what I could say to the, those of us who are already doing it is to say, hey, let's like 2022. Each of us commit to getting one friend's butt in the seat and uh, convince one other because uh, you know we can all talk to ourselves and say, yeah, EVs aren't they the best? But um, you, we all know that that uh, there's a lot more people left to to convince. So let's let's keep it going. Yeah, th th you're you're absolutely right. Th th there's a there's a deep uh, sea out there of people who are actually totally unaware <laughs> of what's happening here, and I, I meet them all the time. It's changing, thankfully, and and uh, and changing for the better. But uh, it's huge market out there of folks who who um, want and, or, or need to learn about uh, all of the benefits uh, that come along with electrification. And, and I, I think we're all we're all doing what we can in our own space to, to uh, accelerate that and make it happen. And uh, I, I, I want to thank you, uh, the, the three of you very much for this. 
I appreciate the time and I appreciate the input. Some really great uh, ideas and and um, uh, perspectives uh, on this uh, on these issues. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.